Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. The one thing I've really learned from YouTube and my time there is just perseverance. I think what it's really done is it's given me confidence that whatever I pursue in my life, I will improve at and I have a chance of succeeding. So even if I suck at something in the start, there's always a chance or actually it's almost guaranteed that I will get better as long as I stick with it. I started thinking that I had the potential to reach so many more people. And the key in doing that would be showing myself on camera and letting them get to know me a little bit more. The first thing and the biggest problem that I always notice is mentality. I so so many people think that they can't travel. If if they do, they go on one vacation a year to like 10 for a week and that's it. It's really cool when you realize that anything you watch can be a learning experience and you can watch the most seemingly worthless YouTube videos or TV programs but there's a reason you're watching them they're doing something right and if you can try to figure out what that is and adapt it to what you want to do I think it's very valuable Even if you're young don't let your age stop you and don't postpone things until you're older until you're ready or you're more prepared you can start today even if you're 10 if you have a passion that you've identified and that you enjoy spending time with that's such a blessing to start with use that passion and try to express it and do something creative with it because it's even more rewarding than the passion in itself Hi there, it's Fei Wu, your host for the Face World podcast. I want to acknowledge you if you are actually new to the show. I sometimes forget to introduce myself, what this podcast is all about. If you're new, welcome. Please stick around, subscribe. We love you. I've noticed there are a lot of new listeners from the past few months. So, well, today's episode is quite exciting. The guest is only 20 years old, who is a YouTuber and who has been on YouTube since he was just 12. Can you imagine that? His channel is called Nonstop Dan. So Dan is obviously his first name. Um, so as a reminder, this is a two-part episode. Most of our interview format episodes are going to be two-part now because you guys have asked that 30 minutes is what you prefer and sometimes 45 minutes to an hour is a little too long. But this episode is exciting and is especially for you if you want to travel or travel more but haven't had the opportunity or you feel like you don't have the money or the time. To be honest, I used to feel that way for a very long time and I still do a little bit, which is why I think Dan will add tremendous value uh, to my life. Yeah, if you believe travel is only reserved for the rich people, this episode will blow your mind, not just change your mind. Dan believes that everyone deserves a chance to explore the world because there are endless culture to see, places to go, mind-opening conversations to have. He wants to live a life without regret and not limiting himself by the impossible. So we talk about tactics uh, via this episode, which you can use immediately. I mean, I literally took actions right after I hung up and I <laughs> applied for the credit card that Dan recommended, which I never thought about leveraging points and this and that. I mean, there's so many options out there. Where do you even begin or start? And uh, we also talked about Dan's creative process because look, anybody can start a YouTube channel, but to actually make it successful, sustain it, engage with not just subscribers, but real people on your channel can be a little bit daunting. And at the age of 20, Dan has a tremendous mindset. He doesn't give up very easily. He is very mature. Someone I feel like 
has been in like doing business, in the business for a long time. There's a lot of stories to share, and I want you to hear it directly from Dan. He's such a sweet person. And before uh, we dive right into the episode, quick announcement on all the projects that Face World is working on. The number one thing top of mind for us right now is the documentary, which is technically a docu-series. It's going to come in six parts of about 12 to 14 minutes each. We've been working on it endlessly, and it's coming out in at the beginning of 2019. If you want to follow us, explore more happy stories and uh, behind the scenes stuff, please connect and subscribe to our special newsletter just for the documentary via faceworld.com forward slash documentary. Without further ado, please join Nonstop Dan and myself on the Face World podcast. I'll see you at the end of the show. I have a question. I I read your bio. I know that I know you live you live in Sweden yes. and your dad is from New York. Exactly. Uh, but I was born in London actually. So I lived in the UK until I was 9 and then my parents got divorced so my dad moved home to New York and I moved to my mom's hometown in Sweden. And where did you get that American accent from? Uh yeah, this is a funny question because I had a British accent when I was little and I was kind of ashamed of it once I moved to Sweden. And I know it's weird because everyone, when you're older, loves a British accent. But, you know, when, when I'd visit my dad in the US, my cousins and other kids would be like, why do you talk so weird? And then in Sweden, American pop culture is so big. So everyone would... They just thought it was cooler to have an American accent. So slowly, I lost my British accent. And then I was like, okay, let me try to at least make it American. So I had my whole family on dad's side to imitate. And I still spent a bit of time there. So I guess when I was about 14, it was cemented as an American accent. (laughs) I love that story. Please share it on YouTube. Because I'm sure many people are wondering, that's something I noticed right away. Your accent is so authentic that... If I didn't read your bio, you could be a kid from California for or from New York. Awesome. For as yeah. far as I know. Yeah, my uh, my family has most of them have very strong New York accents. So I, if you hear them, I don't really sound like them. But um, I guess that's good that at least like English is my mother tongue. So at least it, it sounds like it's my mother tongue. Yeah. So let's talk about you, uh, Dan. I am. So happy to have you because our podcast for the past four years have been celebrating what we call the self-made artists and unsung hero and unsung heroes. And you're certainly one of them because I want to share this message because instead of waiting to be chosen, uh, waiting to be picked, we're thinking that ordinary people uh, will not have been able to achieve something of their own dream. Their passion is simply false. So could you tell us a little bit about your origin story, it, like who you are and what is that you're known for? Uh, okay, so my name is Daniel. I'm best known for my YouTube videos. Uh, my channel is called Nonstop Dan. And at the moment, I do a lot of flight reviews. I'm known to be very honest and sometimes a little bit brutal. Um, but I just always share my true experiences when I travel and I'm, try- I'm starting to do more type of tutorial videos or instructional videos to help people do the same thing. Because ultimately, the reason that I do this now, I've stuck with my channel for almost nine years, is that I see that I can inspire other people, especially young people, to um, not be limited by their beliefs and realize that you can travel the world. It's perfectly possible. And look at me traveling in first and business class using techniques um, like maximizing credit cards, things like that on a lower than normal income. I only have 200,000 subscribers. um, And most people will know that most YouTubers don't live off an income from 200,000 subscribers. I am learning that slowly as well. Uh, Since you mentioned YouTube... I know a gentleman who's actually working on the uh, the Face World documentary with me also has a YouTube channel of about 200, 250,000 subscribers. And what I learned was that, you know, YouTubers get paid 
through the number of downloads or uh, um, you know, viewership and also through really the ads themselves. And what I have seen as I'm plowing through all the videos you've, you've uploaded that you had many videos with over 1 million, maybe there's one over two to 3 million views. So yeah, tell, tell us how, how you make a living mm-hmm. there. So uh, there's this common misconception that YouTubers are paid based on the number of subscribers or based on the number of likes and stuff like that. That's not how it works. There's Google AdSense, which is what we put on the videos and Google just automatically puts ads on them. So anytime a viewer watches the ad before the video, sometimes there will be ad during the video or um, something will pop up from the bottom. Those are the times when we get paid by Google. And if someone clicks the ad, the the rate increases a little more. But that's the only way right now that YouTube will pay us. They just also introduced this thing called channel memberships. It's very new. Not many people use it. But I guess that's another way that YouTube is trying to generate a more steady stream of income for influencers. Because for me, it's a big problem even in life when I'm trying to tell people how much I make for tax purposes or anything like that, because it can vary so much from month to month. Uh, you know, if I get a viral video, suddenly I'm making three times what I would make during a normal month. Uh, and I'm at that point right now where I had one last month that really took off. And now I'm wondering, okay, so next month, how much will I make? It's so, so hard to predict. So it makes it difficult for me to know, okay, how should I be spending my money? How much should I be putting away for tuition and things like that? You know? Wow. And uh, you know, you're, you're only 21. A lot of the kids, myself included, when I was that age, I really wasn't thinking too much about finance. I was learning a lot of that on my own. Um, but I'm really glad that someone in your position, you're able to start thinking about it and strategically about how you're getting paid, where the money will go. So you're attending, so you're still a college student. How do you manage yeah. to attend school and travel <laughs> full time? Um, so I'm uh, I'm starting my sophomore year now. So I've only done my freshman year. And in Sweden, everyone graduates high school when they're 19. So I didn't take like three gap years. But I am studying full-time, as you said. What makes my university really unique and quite perfectly fit for me is that every semester, the entire student body moves to a new country. So just there, I get uh, an excuse to travel. And of course, so this fall, for example, I'm moving to South Korea. and I've never been there before. So that gives me a reason to explore as much as I can. And I can kind of... People at my school understand, besides my YouTube channel, that we haven't been to many places around there. So we want to go out. We want to see as much as we can, especially when we have the chance to spend four months living there. What is that you study, Dan? (laughs) So um, just like any US school, my school... um, allows you to study a wide variety of things. It's a liberal art college. So you can study everything from um, theoretical science to social sciences, business, um, computational science. And for me, I'm very interested in um, politics and those types of things. So I'm studying social sciences, but also business because it's very useful to apply right now. I can take what I learn, try to apply it on my YouTube channel and see what happens. And then it's kind of trial and error um, but so far, just what I learned last year has been super helpful for my channel. What, for example, um, such as? So we spoke a lot about um, organizations and trying to find a purpose, something to drive you more than just a short-term goal. So posing these questions made me really think, okay, what do I want to do with my channel more than just reach 200,000 subscribers or get a video with a million views? There's so much more to YouTube than that. And I think you can connect so much better with your audience when you identify what uh, is important to you. And then you can tell your viewers about that and hopefully they resonate and it just creates a stronger community, a clearer path of where to go. I I think it's very true because um, we have interviewed several YouTubers and also people who are very successful on Instagram and the stories that I love so much is not because they necessarily have two to three million followers or very few interactions, but instead they have what I think is very close to a thousand true fans, except for you know two hundred thousand in this case or a hundred thousand, where there's so many comments and engagement. So 
I think it takes certain maturity and awareness to really think about that because most people your age, if they're you know generally on social media, they're probably thinking about the likes and the subscribers. So who are your audience? How has it, how has that evolved? Like who do you speak to? Yeah, I love that you said that because I think especially to young people, it's such a numbers game. Everyone gets caught up in trying to get as many followers as possible. But uh, what we don't realize is that people can have a ton of followers, but they can have very little influence. And people can have a thousand followers, but they can have more influence than someone with a hundred thousand just because they connect with their audience on another level. So that's what I've been realizing too. And given that I've kind of grown up with my YouTube channel, I've had so many different perspectives on what it is to me and what I want. And now just part of studying at university made me realize this, that, okay, it's not about the numbers. It's about a genuine connection. And just a year ago, for example, I felt like, oh, I'm swamped in comments or I'm swamped in DMs. It's hard to respond and stuff. But now I truly do try to respond to every single direct message I get. I try to um, like and reply to as many comments as I can just to connect with my viewers because they know me, they see me through my videos, but I don't really know them. And I don't want it to be this one one way street where they're just getting an input from me. I want to hear what they think and really engage with them on a deeper level so that we can build these stronger bonds. Wow. You probably have noticed a change or a difference right yes. away. Like, <laughs> What are some of the feedback? Uh, I just notice now. So when I, it's kind of like an evil cycle, but it's an amazing cycle to have because when I started to respond to DMs, suddenly I'm getting, feels like I'm getting even more DMs all the time. They're just increasing and increasing and people write me and say, Hey, um, I told my friend about you and I showed them, or actually usually it's like, okay, my friend told me about your videos and I found them and I love them so much. And then another one is like, hey, this friend told me about you. So it creates this network effect. And I noticed that myself with influencers I like, if I ever DM them, just something like looks beautiful or something, reply to their story and they answer me, I, I just get so happy and I feel like, wow, they're my friend. They value me. So I can understand what effect that has on my audience, just feeling like I am hearing them I do care about them and I am not just there for the numbers or for the influence. Hey, it's Faye and you're listening to the Face World Podcast. Nonstop Dan is a popular YouTube channel originally started by a 12-year-old boy named Dan, who's on the show today. Dan believes that everyone deserves a chance to explore the world. He is 20 years old now and a college student, but he has not stopped traveling. That's a lovely message because especially hearing from someone you know, their own age, uh, it, it means a lot. And it's in a way that I've been doing this, um, not as long as you've had the YouTube channel, but the podcast has been around for four years. And I know your channel, which I went all the way back, started in 2010. Uh, so I realized that, that we too are speaking to a very specific cohort. We don't have an insane amount of subscribers, but the people are engaging at a much deeper level. Uh, which is just so satisfying. So I completely understand where you're coming from. How do you not let fame get to you? Because now you're flying first business class. And then I, I see all these flight attendants be like, oh, yeah. Dan. This, you know, I, so what, what is it like to be here? <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't exactly consider myself famous yet. Um, I think that, as I said, it's very important to stay grounded. and if you get caught up in this idea of being famous and being better than than other people, that will just ultimately have a negative consequence. And what we see with a lot of YouTubers, and I'm really starting to realize this as well, that the big, big YouTubers who have had a demise, the reason for their demise is that they become commercialized. They start hanging out with regular celebrities and they lose this genuineness. They lose... They don't seem like a real person anymore. They're not relatable. And that's what leads to their downfall. But then we have some YouTubers like Shane Dawson. And he's been on YouTube for 10, 10 plus years. 
and he keeps reinventing himself. And at this point, he has almost 20 million subscribers. His videos get like 10 to 15 million views. And he, he is genuinely a huge celebrity. But through this all, he has never lost sight of the fact that the reason he is here today is because of his viewers. And he's so dedicated to them that he just doesn't let anything else get in the way. And I think that's what's so important, regardless of how big you are, just realizing that you are the same as everyone else who's watching your videos. And the best thing you can do is try to help them and support them and just be kind. <laughs> I like that a lot because I'm also hearing that the the personalities and the psychologies are changing rapidly on YouTube. And a lot of people, YouTubers actually quit, unfortunately, as a result of it. So let's talk about creativity creativity for a second because my favorite thing to do on YouTube is to go back to the very first video anyone has created, especially the famous people. And I do this because so many people will follow a podcaster and go back to episode number one. And I remember how nerve-wracking that was when somebody said that to me. I said, why? I have 160 episodes. Why did you have to go to the first one? And then they said, I want to see how you evolved. So, Mm. you know, which all of a sudden I realized, why am I feeling ashamed? I shouldn't be, right? Because we all have a starting point. And so uh, I want to kind of put you back to when you were a little boy, because you were 14 years old at this. I mean, how Uh, old were you? (laughs) Yeah, I was 12 when I started my channel. So I was really a little boy (laughs) pre-puberty. (laughs) <laughs> so tell us about what was the intention back then? You know, how did you feel if you still remember? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, as most 12-year-olds, I was just... Mostly my life was about having fun. And I was trying to just get an outlet for my creativity. I've loved planes my whole life. And I guess just about a couple months prior to starting my channel, I'd started watching some YouTube videos of just flight simulators and some plane spotting, things like that. And without much thought, I just figured, I want to do this too. I'm playing this flight simulator game as well. And I want to share with my... Or It wasn't really about sharing anything. It was just about creating something. And I saw what other people were doing and I wanted to copy it. So I started uploading terrible videos. Thankfully, those aren't on my channel anymore. Because if you really got to see my first video, you would be like, what on earth is this? But I was recording my computer screen with like a little handheld camera that shot in like 480p. And uh, it was just terrible for a few months. I was getting like 10, 15 views. But to me, that was so much. And I was like, wow, who are these 10 people who found my video? Uh, and then I started getting like 10, 20, 30 subscribers. And you just slowly evolve. And I think it's interesting when you mention your podcast, because I always feel like I try to up my game with every single video. So everyone is supposed to be better than the last. So even if you go back three months, six months, I'll be like, oh no, are you watching that video? That's terrible. I can't even understand sometimes how people like watching those videos. But then I remember that, okay, in six months time, I'll probably be feeling that way about what I'm making now as well. So it is a constant evolution. And especially having grown up with this, not only has my um, production quality increased, but just the way that I think about it and how I can logically reason that, okay, maybe people will find this interesting and this other thing they might not find so interesting. When I was little, I just posted whatever I wanted and was like, this is what I have, world. Yeah. You you brought up something, not explicitly, but the idea of making progress. I noticed in my 20s and up till my early 30s, I was working for different companies and a, a struggle and a pain point that everybody had in their private conversations, lunch, dinner, is that, hey, am I making progress? And it was really hard to tell. And when people exclusively look at promotions or ranks alone, right, it's not always an accurate measure because sometimes not always the best, the most creative people get to move to the top of the corporate ladder. But I think what you're describing at such a young age right now uh, is the fact that you know, you can tell, you can sense what progress looks like. And 
how I went on, how has that informed your life to know that you could get better, right? And it's not a death sentence if something doesn't work out well. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, I love that question so much. And I think I think what it's really done is it's given me confidence that whatever I pursue in my life, I will improve at and I have a chance of succeeding. So even if I suck at something in the start, there's always a chance or actually it's almost guaranteed that I will get better as long as I stick with it. That's almost... I don't talk about this so often, but the one thing I've really learned from YouTube and my time there is just perseverance because I've been on there for so long and bad stuff has happened. Like my channel got terminated once because someone tried, someone hacked me. Uh, My AdSense got shut down when I was 14, all this stuff. And I just fought through it. I didn't, I wasn't like, okay, I'll just give up on my channel. I, I emailed everyone I could at YouTube, help me out. This was not my doing, even though my channel was small and they managed to reinstate it. I got AdSense back, all this stuff, just by pushing through and realizing that everything bad that happens is ultimately a learning experience and you can come out of it so much stronger. There are such amazing things that can happen when you persist with something and don't just give up as soon as the results start getting less satisfying or you start feeling less satisfied by doing something. No, it's it's beautiful because, you know, as creators, I, I always tell people it's hard enough to be a creator because what you're doing is that uh, you are putting something out in the world that simply didn't exist before. A version of it did. But, you know, I've seen many flights videos, but you bring in your own perspective. So how do you deal with the turbulence currently on YouTube these days? The negative comment, I know even if they're anonymous and they're trying to be mean on purpose, but it's really hard on the soul and on the gut, yeah, <laughs> like in yeah. the gut. So yeah. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's hard not to take comments personally, but you just got to try to realize that these people don't know you. They're um, angry at something in their own lives and they're trying to take it out over you. And YouTube is really one of those platforms where people can say anything they want anonymously. There's no consequences and people will show that they don't like you however they can. And that there also, it's just about persevering because... Although the hate sucks to some extent, that means that you're succeeding, you're reaching more people and you're at the point where you're obviously doing something where a few people feel so intimidated or I guess insecure by what you're doing that they feel the need to be very aggressive or so toward you. So yeah, I just try to view my hate comments as a positive thing. I really do. Sometimes it's hard, but I'm like, okay, this is the price of success. This is what it. This is just a, a small cost for all the other amazing comments I'm getting uh, and the positive developments that are occurring. Yeah, I find a level of maturity with people who start creating when they're younger to be on a completely different plane because. I think we, for you, you have to look back to, I guess, before age 12 of a cousin or a friend will say something to you. You will think for a second, oh, that's not fair. Uh, But obviously there's also that real relationship towards that person. But when somebody who really knows nothing about you and can literally grab, could just be be trolling, could say something completely irrelevant, that you're able to put that in a different perspective and yeah. Much yeah. Invincible and stoppable now. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And I I assume uh later in life I'll be able to apply this in other areas if I have critics in real life who are saying stuff to my face, then I can um hopefully take that with a grain of salt and uh, use the same lessons I learned on YouTube. That's wonderful. So I I uh, find very intriguing the way that you have changed uh, the way you structure the video. So um, I was looking at 2010 and 2011, 13, 14. It took a few years for you to go from the silent Dan, uh, here's the plane taking off landing, a uh, very minimal, maybe a couple of interviews with other people to now you're really f- being front and centered. And that's when that's when your personality, everything really came through. So tell me about that transition. Yeah. That was hard for me when I was younger because at first I I only made videos in a flight simulator. So it didn't really make sense for me to be in my videos. But then I started thinking that 
this is not really sustainable. There's only so many people that enjoy watching a wing view video or a plane spotting video, things like that. And I knew that I had the potential to reach so many more people. And the key in doing that would be showing myself on camera and letting them get to know me a little bit more. But I started... I, yeah, I guess I started with showing myself on camera in 2014. I made my first vlog style video. But it's taken since then and I still struggle with it being vulnerable and being honest because it's so hard for some people to put themselves out there on the internet. And you know, the more personal and vulnerable you get, the more painful the hate comments can get, I think too, because they really know more about you. They know what they know how to hit close to home. But like back in the day, if someone said, Oh, this wing view video sucks, I'd be like, Okay, whatever, I don't care. They're not offending me. They're just saying that they didn't enjoy the video. But you know, you also realize that the biggest YouTubers are the ones that are as honest and vulnerable as possible. And it's such a journey to get there. And I think it's a learning experience to be more vulnerable in real life as well, because just I have a hard time being vulnerable on YouTube. I also have a hard time being vulnerable about strangers. But I think there's something so valuable to being able to talk to strangers about how you're feeling. And like just an example that I think is so funny. At my, uh, I was at this graduation party in May and I met this woman I had never, ever seen before. And she just tells me, Yeah, Daniel, uh, I admire you so much for being out with your boyfriend. Um, because it is, we live in a relatively small town. And, and she said, yeah, my son is actually transsexual. And it's been a very hard journey for him. So just having other LGBT people in the town who can be proud and out is a very big deal. And then she started talking about a lot of issues they've had at home. And she really, really opened up. And I was like, wow, this woman feels like such a close friend all of a sudden. I just met her, but I feel like I could talk to her for hours and it just creates this bond uh, versus small talk and being inauthentic and just talking about general stuff. It doesn't really get you there. So I want to learn to be as out there as possible, but it is a journey. And also, of course, as a teenager, especially, you're always scared of being judged. And not, like high school, for example, is a very judgmental time. So also, now that I'm out of high school, I guess I have um, just more perspective. And as time goes by, it's okay to be more and more open and show more and more of myself. Yeah. And the, the way you describe that building a relationship, an authentic relationship, it's such an incredible journey because there is so much small talk everywhere else. Even among, you know, when you go to work, go to school, that people who supposedly know you really well, but it doesn't always happen. Hi there, it's Faye again. Thanks so much for listening to part one of the interview. Don't forget, there is part two. If you're on your podcast app, all you have to do is go to your episodes and scroll right up. Part two should appear right above part one. And if you're using a different app like I am, I love Overcast, the way that you will find uh, part two is under unplayed episodes should also be right above part one.